The story of Toyota is very much a family saga. It began in 1891 when Sakichi Toyota, a young carpenter, patented his first invention, a wooden manually operated loom at the age of 24. Wanting to make a better loom for his hardworking mother, he would soon invent Japan's first automatic loom, and the company we know today as Toyota was born. It would be his son, Kiichiro, who would realize his father's dream of building an automobile for Japan, which he did in 1936, when he introduced the very first Toyota, the Model AA. An engineer by trade, Kiichiro developed the AA without any formal training in car manufacturing, but through sheer determination and ingenuity, single-handedly gave birth to Japan's automotive industry. In 1982, Kiichiro's son, Shoichiro, became president of the newly formed Toyota Motor Corporation, successfully unifying the sales and manufacturing entities of Toyota. By 2009, Toyota had grown to the world's largest automotive manufacturer, and the reins were handed to grandson of the founder, Akio Toyota, who took charge during one of the company's most challenging periods. Credited for successfully returning Toyota back to health, Akio is uniquely dedicated to the company that bears his name. I love cars. The communication between myself and the car is always very natural, nothing to hide. Being in the car gives me the energy. I feel myself, and that's why I like it. I kind of grew up with cars, and the excitement of cars, I decided to join Toyota and start learning about the automobile from scratch. The more I learned about automobiles, the more I respect my name, and then the more responsibility to my name. Toyota is such a big corporation. However, even the big corporation needs some kind of face, needs kind of character. That is my role, or I think that is my mission. I never met my grandfather, but uh, I tried to, to think what he think. We back to the original idea. Uh, we want to make the car and then we contribute to the society. Trained as a master driver, Akio's enthusiasm for Toyota is perhaps no more keenly felt than when he is taking someone on a test drive. Ladies and gentlemen, the president and CEO of Toyota Motor Corporation, Akio Toyota. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Let me begin by thanking all of you for taking the time to join us today and for supporting us with your investment in Toyota. So I think from that opening video, you have learned at least two things about me. Number one, I love cars, always have, always will. Number two, I am the third generation Toyota to lead this company. And perhaps you have heard the saying that the third generation ruins everything. <laughs> well, it's something I've heard all my life. And it's something I'm determined to prove wrong. The company my grandfather Kichiro founded began with his desire to improve the economy of Japan and the lives of its citizens. It was founded upon deeply held Japanese values, like respect for people and continuous improvement, or Kaizen. And those qualities remain at the heart of who we are. But just as we once made a dramatic shift from making looms to making automobiles. Today, we are planning a new chapter for Toyota as we enter a new era of mobility. The automobile industry is changing at a speed 
for greater than anyone anticipated. Our real competitors no longer make cars, they make technologies. Autonomous cars, alternative powertrains, mobility as a services, robotics. There are new frontiers, and the race is on. We view this change as an opportunity, an opportunity to create new revenue streams, new options for our customers, and new profits and growth for our shareholders. It's this kind of disruption that I think makes the automobile industry alive with possibility. In my opinion, our industry is not just alive and well. We are about to ride a new wave of profound growth. Now, I think perhaps a little basic background about Toyota might be in order at this point. Here's a look at Toyota by the numbers. Currently, Toyota is the world's third largest automotive company with anticipated global sales this year of 10.3 million units. We have sold a total of approximately 250 million units to date since we began in 1937. And we currently sell over 100 models in over 170 countries. Most importantly, we proudly employ over 364,000 team members around the world. This chart sums up our revenue and profit over the last 10 years. As you can see, we are a little lower in operating profit this year. But that is due in large part to significant investment we are making in technologies that we think will pay off handsomely in the near future. I'm also happy to say that we've maintained our distribution to shareholders at a healthy 30%, and which will continue to maintain or increase. Our record growth in 2015 and 16 is what allows us to make major investments in all new powertrains and platform, or what we call Toyota New Global Architecture. It has also allowed us to form new companies, such as the Toyota Research Institute, Toyota Connected, and Artificial Intelligence Ventures, all of which you will hear more about today. So let me start by updating you on the status of a luxury brand, Lexus. The Lexus brand was the experiment of my father, Shoichiro Toyoda, who was the president of Toyota at the time. He decided to take the advice of some very wise and persistent US dealers and create a new luxury brand here in the US in 1989. Thanks to the high quality and high value of the first Lexus LS, Lexus became, to our surprise, something an overnight success. Within just 10 years, we are the number one luxury brand in the US. Personally, there's always been a special place in my heart for Lexus. Toyota might be my last name, but believe me, Lexus is my middle name. <laughs> so when I became president, I remember being on stage in 2011, revealing a brand new GS to a group of journalists. And I couldn't wait for their reactions. This is just another boring Lexus, they said. Seriously, I couldn't believe it. But you know what? I took another look at that GS. In fact, I took another look at all our cars, both Toyota and Lexus, and I said, they're right. From then on, it was game on. I was determined that the word boring and the word Lexus would never be used in the same sentence again. 
first four to 2017. And our lineup went from this to this. Part of this transformation was the creation of the LFA, a 550-horsepower supercar that became the DNA for new generation of Lexus vehicles. Today, a new Lexus flagship coupe is this beautiful LC500 that has recently gone on sales around the world. Lexus will always remain a challenger brand but I can assure you, it will never be boring. When it comes to manufacturing, we made significant investment to not just build ever better cars, but to build them more cost effectively. Through a new process and global architecture we call TMGA, at the same time, we are expanding our manufacturing capacity as well. You may be aware of a recent announcement to build a new plant with Mazda here in the United States. Mazda is a longtime partner who not only shares Toyota's love of cars, they motivate us to stay ahead. Simply by being a strong competitor, joining forces will allow us to increase production capacities. And it will also support a mutual development of electric vehicles. By investing in our associates, the men and women who make our cars, is every bit as important to us. Without them, there will be no such thing as a Takumi craftsmanship or the level of quality that we are known for. They are truly the most precious resources we have, and their dedication is the backbone of our Toyota production system. Take a look. Human capital is absolutely the key to our manufacturing process. Everything we do, our Toyota production system, our built-in quality, our Kaizen, everything is based on the way that the people can contribute, work together to the performance of the company. Toyota's manufacturing philosophy really hinges on TPS, the Toyota production system. There are three things that are really core. One is just-in-time production. That means that nothing gets to that assembly line until it's ready to go into one of our cars. And also, we have what's called a joka, and that means the team members have the power to stop the line when anything abnormal happens. That kind of empowerment of a team member makes the Toyota production system, I think, really effective. And then the last thing that's so important is Kaizen, which is continuous improvement. We believe that there is always a better way to do things. TNGA, the Toyota New Global Architecture, is the fundamental change of the way we build vehicles. We've redesigned our manufacturing systems, our platforms, our powertrains. The basic structure of the company has changed. The starting point was how to make better car, better value for the customer. For every vehicle, we have an embedded cost that as we spread it out over a number of vehicle lines, that cost becomes amortized and is lower. With this new architecture, the manufacturing processes are more similar. And so the ability to build different vehicles on different lines has increased. With one TNGA platform, we can make a tremendous number of vehicles. So if we see a shift, be it from sedans to SUVs or from large or small vehicles, we can more quickly respond to this changing in demand. With TNGA, the vehicles are much more fun to drive. The platforms are much wider and allow for a better structure of the vehicle to be built around a lower center of gravity. Also, suspension geometry is much better. It allows for better road feel, ride comfort, better handling performance, and a dramatic improvement in fuel economy. It's not small changes. These are huge changes. TNGA has given us a boost of inspiration. It's the first time that we have seen a complete transformation of a company of our scale where we've started from scratch in every area. The company structure, the vehicle powertrains, the platform, 
the electronics, the multimedia. Everything is completely new. The Camry is the best example of that. It's brand new in every area. And this is really something that we've never seen in Toyota. Some company just said, no, manufacturing can be completely subcontracted. This is the opposite for us. We are very proud of our global ability to make things by ourselves. With TNGA, it's not a small step, it's a huge step. We're not just standing still. Toyota's moving forward for the future. We built our manufacturing reputation on the Toyota production system. And it's just-in-time strategy and efficiency. But we have also used it to help nonprofit organizations to increase their productivity and to assist those in need more quickly. By teaching TPS to these organizations, we are able to help make their rescue efforts after natural disasters more effective. By making wait time shorter or rebuilding houses more quickly, sharing TPS is one way we can give back to our communities. And when we combine TPS with Toyota's new global architecture, it not only makes us more efficient and cost effective, it is the reason we have been able to make fundamental change in the design and performance of our vehicles for both brands. QDR, or quality, durability, and reliability will always be one of the reasons to purchase a Toyota or a Lexus. But we want to appeal to your heart as well as your head, as in, wow, that's cool, or I got to have that. And when they drive them, they should be fun. They should be what we call wakudoki, which means heart racing and adrenaline pumping. When we rebuilt our new Camry this past January, it was actually called sexy by the press. Can you believe it? Well, we think it is pretty sexy. And our designers and engineers have really been working as one to create a new standard for performance and design. Take a look. I think the one thing above everything else that Akio has given us in design is confidence. We now have a platform upon which to stand and somebody who's willing to support us and push us to the limit. He's passionate about design. He's passionate about cars. They're not just transportation tools. There's a deeper meaning to why we move, why we love cars. I think Akio inspires the design team because he's a car guy himself and he knows the product. To know that the head of the company puts on a five-point harness and gets in the car at the Nürburgring and drives flat out, that's pretty cool. I met him so many times, but the mostly they're in the car <laughs> behind the wheel. That's a very unique case for chief engineer and the CEO is talking each other in yeah. the car, yeah. more than conference room. So he really is a catalyst to push us forward. The Lexus design ethos is basically to be the most avant-garde prestige brand in the world, very simply. We are utilizing our youth to approach the prestige market in a completely different way. We have only 28 years history. So in order to, you know, uh, make our position, we have to be different. Since 2012, we start, started to change the attitude to the more aggressive side. So we started from spindle wheel. I think LC500 is a really good example of new form language that pushes the brand in a much more exciting and passionate direction. I remember we had a meeting with uh, Simon Humphreys. At the time, he was the head of global design. And the assignment was, he just said, make a beautiful coupe. <laughs> and I'll never, I'll never forget that. Of course, you know, he said it in this really cool British accent. But, you know, it's exciting to have that much freedom. It's also scary. 
The reaction to the Lexus LFLC concept car was phenomenal. I mean, everybody loved that car. Accio loved it, and the dealers loved it, and the press loved it. It was basically, let's go, let's make this thing. When I saw the concept car, it's beautiful, but I said, it's impossible to make it real. But Accio's answer is, that's the reason. We need a challenge. That's the beginning. Yeah, that's the beginning. Akio's involvement in getting the LC500 was paramount. And the direction that it was taking Lexus was a totally new direction. And he totally supported that design. Four years later, after showing the concept car, we unveiled the LC500. And I remember rolling the car onto the Lexus stand. And one of my best friends who was heading up a European design studio turns to me and says, why are you guys rolling out the concept car again? And <laughs> I started laughing. I'm like, that's not the concept car. That's the production car. And he couldn't believe it. And the next two days, basically, we were, we were just listening to people in their awe and their surprise that this company took a concept car and made it real. I worked with akio for this car since almost five years. He never asked me the specs. Always he drive a car. How did it feel the car? Cannot be measured. So that's the value of the Lexus brand from now on. So we want to provide more emotional value for the customer. It's not in the brochure. We are standing at the uh, edge of the new era. For Toyota, it was a little bit different. We said, OK, we're a mass maker. Now what's our strength? We're offering variety and diversity. You know, we had the best-selling car in North America for 15 years straight. And Camry was the first car to be completely part of the TNGA process from scratch. This new TNGA platform allowed us to do things that we couldn't do before. We were able to plant the car to the ground. We wanted to clearly communicate a low center of gravity. So we pushed the wheels out to the corners. We pushed the roof down. We pushed the hood down. We even push the cabin down. So what's really great about that is it not only makes a cool styling statement, but when you sit in the car, your outward visibility is great. In fact, your forward visibility is improved by 40%. And that really improves the driving experience. Recently, we presented a concept car called the Concept Eye. We wanted to answer the question, what does driving mean for Toyota in the year 2030? We have to think of new ways to embrace the autonomous era, but at the same time, you know, have people have fun in their vehicles, which is something that we don't want to throw away. I think whatever happens, our products are always going to have uh, a soul to them. They're always going to be fun to drive, whatever that is. Whether it's driving you or you're driving the vehicle, there's always going to be this connection. We're going to work hard to create increasingly more desirable products that people want based on an emotional reaction. I think people are taking notice. They're becoming believers that, hey, Toyota really is changing. Other than autonomy, there's probably nothing more debated or talked about in our industry right now than electric vehicles. At Toyota, we have been in the electrification business for some time now. When we came to market over 20 years ago with the first hybrid engines we call hybrid synergy drive, we still believe electric vehicles will continue to play a significant role in this new era of mobilities, which is why we created a separate EV division to focus solely on battery electric vehicles. You may be surprised to know that battery electric vehicles represent less than 1% of the market right now. In fact, hybrid, a market that we basically invented, is still only 3% of the market. But we've seen hybrid sales rapidly increase in recent years. And we believe that 
EV and fuel cell technology will follow this same path. When people ask me what I think will be driving 10, 20, 30 years from now, I tell them, I don't think it will be just one thing. I don't think every powertrain works for every market. That's why our strategy is to place bets on all options. Japan, for example, has no natural resources, but hydrogen, which can be created from water or even waste, is easily available. As a country, Japan is committed to a hydrogen future. So for that market, fuel cell vehicles will become the top powertrain. In the Middle East, where there is plenty of access to gas, gasoline engines or hybrids will remain dominant. And in Norway, where it's easy to make electricity and the government is financially supporting EV, I predict EV will be their pattern of choice. The point is, we don't believe there's only one way. We be the customer and the market will choose. So that's why we are creating a wide portfolio of powertrain and why we're working to make each one best in class. For me, when it comes to alternative powertrains, it's not so much about who gets there first, but who makes it the best. That's always been our philosophy. Here is a bit more. I think Toyota is by far in the best shape of any automaker on earth regarding preparedness for the future, specifically with alternative powertrains. Toyota's been at work for many years now on battery technologies. Uh, we've put many, many powerful batteries in all of our hybrids around the world that we've been selling in mass volume already. We believe that electrification is the path towards the future. And as such, hybrids were step one. The next step we believe is moving towards pure electric vehicles. We have products in the pipeline that are gonna meet the needs of both Lexus at the luxury end of the market and products that we can put in the Toyota lineup that are more affordable. Electric vehicles that are battery powered or what we call BEVs, we think those have an opportunity, particularly if there are some advances in battery technology that starts to make that a more exciting vehicle, an easier to own vehicle with quicker recharging times, longer range, affordability improved instead of only being at the high end of the marketplace. You may have seen a recent announcement that Toyota made regarding battery technology that we see now feasible, the commercialization of what we call a solid state battery. The solid state battery is really exciting. It's a huge breakthrough potentially in electric vehicles. For the first time, we could be really looking at the ability to have an electric vehicle that has performance capabilities equivalent to or better than its gasoline equivalent that could compete on price, so high density capability in a relatively compact and lightweight package, the ability to store a lot of energy in that package, the ability to charge that rather rapidly and still have good durability. I believe it puts Toyota in a very good position regarding future ability to compete in the electrified vehicle space. The Toyota Mirai is an all electric vehicle, but instead of plugging it in, you refill it with hydrogen. You put hydrogen in the tank, the fuel cell creates electricity, and the electricity drives an electric motor. We really believe that's an elegant solution. We started the development of the Mirai, which means the future, in 1992. At about the same time, we started to develop the hybrid synergy drive. It's another zero emission vehicle with the only output being water. You've got the quiet operation of a motor versus an internal combustion engine. You have the low end torque and acceleration that most people like from the EV. Fuel cell delivers that as well. 
In terms of advantage, you eliminate range anxiety. Assuming you have a hydrogen fuel source, you can continue to drive with the refueling speed of putting gasoline in a typical combustion engine. If you lose power to your house with the appropriate accessories, you can actually fuel your house using your fuel cell vehicle. We are the only automaker who makes our own hydrogen tanks in-house. What this did was allow us to increase the productivity, to cut the costs, and to really make a custom tank that was perfect for this vehicle, where other automakers tend to outsource their tanks. The vehicle is sold only in California currently, Japan and also Europe, and we're looking to begin a rollout to the Northeast states as well in the United States. Toyota is not the only company pursuing fuel cell technology. We see this as a positive sign that there are several manufacturers planning to offer or currently offering fuel cell products in the market. This should give some encouragement to the community to roll out more products and more infrastructure. There is a huge effort underway to put into place appropriate infrastructure for the Mirai vehicles all over the world. In Japan, they have a roadmap to over 100 stations, along with a hydrogen society that they plan on building from the ground up. In Europe, mainly in Germany, they have hydrogen roadmap towards 100 stations to support the hydrogen fuel cell fleet there, as well as in California. So worldwide, there is a very strong collaboration among the government, NGOs, energy companies, and the automakers. We have a project going on here in North America we call the Portal Project, where we've created a hydrogen fuel cell heavy-duty tractor trailer, a class eight truck, uh, that we're putting through trials in the port of Long Beach. The purpose of this truck is to run freight up and down the 710 freeway in Los Angeles from the port of Long Beach to a distribution center where the rail yards are. Toyota has seen that as an opportunity to demonstrate a hydrogen fuel cell truck, which would have zero noise pollution, zero local air pollution, and because it's an electric powertrain, it completely changes the way that the truck accelerates and can flow with traffic compared to a diesel truck. In terms of commercial use for fuel cell, Toyota has announced a number of projects within the last year. One of the things we've announced is a fleet of buses that we intend to make available for the Tokyo Olympics in Japan. We also recently announced a partnership with 7-Eleven, the convenience store chain in Japan, to build a fleet of delivery trucks that can support their efforts. We believe that Battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles are synergistic technologies and not competitive technologies. And that as the two advance together, they're going to continue to mutually benefit one another as they infiltrate the market. There are those questioning whether the industry can truly convert to hydrogen, but I think Toyota may come to the party with a little confidence based on past experience. We brought a very small, unusually styled car to market in 2000 that a lot of people turned their nose up at. And I think today there are now 50 hybrid models uh, in the market uh, competing for that same set of buyers. So we have confidence that we can change the paradigm and we're going into the fuel cell discussion with a similar level of confidence. We are working on the future uh, and it is a wide, wide ranging future. Back in the 90s, when I was younger and clearly groovier, <laughs> and still making my way through Toyota, I was working on the manufacturing side, trying to get the production time down by a fraction of a day. Could we make the car in 1.4 days instead of 1.5 days? So when I transferred to the sales and marketing divisions, I couldn't believe that car sat on dealer's lots for up to three months. Instead of just in time, it was just in case. We will have every option on the lot just in case. Well, you can imagine what I thought about that. So I decided to create a sort of underground level team to shake things up, speed our time to market, reduce day supply, and apply our best-in-class production process to the rest of our companies. We called ourselves the Gazoo Divisions. And we kind of thought of ourselves as a Jedi fighting the Empire, which probably sounds strange coming from a guy named Toyota. But to me, innovation is everything. Speed is everything. You might take a swing and hit a foul ball, but you still need to get up to bat. So next thing this Gazoo team did, 
but to try to find a way to connect the consumers with the dealers. In Japan, new car sales were down, and it seemed our only hope was to find a way to increase used car sales. So we came up with a website to share used car inventory at all the dealership with the public, you know, like they do today. But way back then, everybody at Toyota just looked at us and said, what's website? It would be Microsoft who ended up giving my team the support we need to create gazoo.com. Of course, it was a pretty basic website, but it worked. And it became clear to me that we needed to keep innovating in this space. This same Gazoo team and thinking continues to influence everything we do 20 years later. Everything we try to pioneer, it's what behind the recent creation of Toyota Connected, a company designed to harness the power of the internet. Today, the internet, or more specifically, the cloud, is the biggest single disruptor in our industry. And it has the potential to become the biggest source of revenue for our industry. Data and the collection of data is going to allow us to connect cars and provide services in ways we never imagined. And Toyota Connected was created to take advantage of this opportunity. Here is what our old Gazoo team is up to now. Most research firms are predicting somewhere between 25 to 30 billion devices will be connected to the internet by the year 2020. What's unique here at Toyota Connected is that we're the only automotive company focused on building the platform to be able to leverage this data. Akio Toyota had a vision for connectivity and vehicles communicating and making society better way back in the mid-90s. He had the foresight to think about that data is the most important asset that any company has. What makes the, the data that we're collecting so special as opposed to Facebook or Google or some of these other companies is that we have a lot of context behind the data we're collecting. The best example of that is probably our new Camry. We're getting data from it every second. And within that second, we're getting every millisecond of data. We know how fast that vehicle was going, how many seatbelts were buckled, what lane it was in. We also can use that data to understand if there's a hazard on the road and be able to warn the drivers behind them. This is just the beginning of what we can do with this data. We're gonna start providing contextual services to the consumers where an agent can provide information to you, help manage your route, help manage your day, help manage your calendar, even communicate outside of the vehicle to other people on your behalf. It's gonna really revolutionize how we operate our cars. We're blending and taking all of these disparate assets from your remotely connected vehicle to your handheld device to your online experience and turning into one digital transformational experience that will follow you from vehicle to vehicle. We're not an R&D company. We haven't been set up to go and investigate technologies. We've been set up to build technologies. We started off Toyota Connected by first partnering with Microsoft. That has allowed us to reach into their advanced products and their data scientists. It also allowed us to quickly scale because all of the tools that we're building here, we're building out on the cloud. We were set up just over a year ago and already two of our products are in the market. We have a big data center with Saudi Live. We have our car sharing platform, which is live with Servco, one of our distributors in Hawaii. We were able to build the car sharing platform that could allow us not only to provide a service, but also build the technology to enter those vehicles with your smartphone, start and stop the car. And we built all that technology within a few months. Dealers have hundreds, if not millions of dollars worth of inventory. They can take some of that inventory and deploy it within their primary market area to provide car sharing services. The dealership is getting use and revenue out of their asset, and Toyota Connected, as a provider of that platform that enables it, will get license fees. There is tremendous opportunity for revenue streams. We're getting requests 
from industries around the world that want to be able to leverage our platforms. The insurance industry is being disrupted by what we're doing here, all wanting to connect and pay to understand how that particular driver was driving. We can deploy that platform in a matter of a few weeks. Cities want to improve traffic conditions, and one of the easiest ways to do that is by connecting to um, intelligent traffic lights. We're able to provide a lot of that data for them through our connected vehicles, and they're willing to pay for that. When we have autonomous vehicles out in the world, fleet management is going to be key. And one of the platforms that we're building today is a fleet management platform. And the types of revenue that can come when you can manage an autonomous fleet are endless. Providing autonomous technology is huge, but autonomy on its own will not satisfy what the customer needs. All of the aspects around autonomy is what Toyota Connected brings. So we know when a customer needs a vehicle. We will know what type of vehicle he needs. We know where the customer is going. All of the services in the vehicle, whether it's music, video, all of those services we will provide. We're moving the industry to a place where it's about services. And the vehicle itself will deliver those services. And we want to get to a point where the car is utilized more than just 10% going back and forth to work. Maybe we can get utilization up to 80, 90, 95% where the car is actively out doing things, maybe not while you're doing it, but with autonomous technology running errands or picking up people who can't drive for themselves. None of our competitors have built a company that's specifically around vehicle data and unleashing the power of that. And while you see a lot of M&A work, it's gonna be very difficult to take these different assets and try to make them into one experience. The data is not gonna flow from point A to point B, from system to system. What we've built here at Toyota Connected is the differentiator. We created this as a standalone company so we can go at the speed of a startup but have the strength of Toyota behind us. I think it's important for Toyota to innovate outside of its core experience because the industry is changing. And to truly deliver on the vision of a mobility company, it requires us to expand our experience and our knowledge and our expertise outside of just manufacturing and servicing vehicles. And that's what Toyota Connected is here to do. As a big believer in new technology, you might be surprised to know that I was not all that interested in autonomous cars at first. In fact, to me, they sounded boring, which, as you already know, is a word I hate. I'm not interested in turning a car into a soulless commodity. But two things changed my mind. The first was a chance meeting I had with Paralympian, Mickey Matson, who had lost both her legs in a car accident. We had just announced a sponsorship of the Olympic and Paralympics, and she told me that it moved her to reconsider her anger toward cars and said, maybe something good could happen. It was then that I realized how important autonomy could be and how much it could dramatically increase the quality of one's life. And maybe accidents like hers and the suffering involved could be completely eliminated. The second reason I changed my mind about autonomous cars was a man named Gil Pratt. When I first met Dr. Gil Pratt, I thought, man, that guy's tall. <laughs> I also thought he was a genius. An engineering graduate and professor at MIT, Gil also served as manager of the US Defense Advance Research Project Agency, or DAPA. He is one of the foremost science in the field of artificial intelligence and robotics. At our first meeting, he told me that when he was a little boy, he saw his best friend get killed by a car, and that he, too, wanted to make accident a thing of the person. He also agreed that autonomy shouldn't be viewed as merely a replacement for the driver. That autonomy 
could actually enhance the pleasure of driving. If you are confident that the car will always protect you. So I was very happy when he agreed to join Toyota. Two years ago, we committed an initial $1 billion to the creation of the Toyota Research Institute, headed by Dr. Gil Pratt, based in Silicon Valley, with offices in Ann Arbor, Michigan, as well as Boston. TRI now has who's who roster of the world's leading scientists in the field of autonomy, AI, and robotics. And we have research partnership with the leading universities, including MIT and Stanford. Lucky for us, they're hard at work on a vast amount of research project that will translate into autonomous cars. New battery materials, new human machines interface, robots, and more. Working alongside our autonomy division in Japan, TRI will help us create the best possible version of autonomy. I will let them tell you about it in their own words, but I just want to add that in this race to autonomy, we believe in one thing above all, safety first. TRI has a, I think, very unique view on autonomy, and I think it comes from our parent, Toyota, and its view of the relationship between the driver and the car. We think that the driver and the car work together, and that we're actually most excited about them working together as teammates. In fact, the first product that Toyota is putting out in this kind of technology is called the Highway Teammate. Level two autonomy is a system where the driver is expected to always be ready to, at a moment's notice, take control of the car if the autonomy says, I can't do this anymore for whatever reason. So the challenge with level two is that you have to be vigilant. You have to monitor at all times and be ready to take over, even if the system doesn't tell you that it needs takeover. And the big challenge for level two systems is making it such that it's worth doing that. Is it going to be more of a burden to supervise the car and to be ready to accept control back from the car than to actually just manually drive the car. What we're working on at TRI right now is how do we improve that? How do we improve the quality of the drive so that you can have a level two system and it's actually worth engaging? Even though much of the self-driving industry that's emerging has sort of latched onto these two paths of either removing the driver or having the driver be monitoring the autonomy system, we think there's a third path, which is more of this sort of this blend of the human and the machine. Who should guard whom? Should a human being guard the artificial intelligence system, or should the AI guard the human? What does it mean for a driver and a car to work synergistically with each other as teammates? That's the guardian function that we're working on. Guardian autonomy is one where the driver is actually manually driving the car, just as we do now but there's a backseat driver, as it were, that's watching what you're doing all of the time and making its own plans of how it would drive the car if it were in charge. The idea of Guardian is to be as capable as a human driver, but only intervene when it's necessary. We think we're using AI to guard the human, and I think it's gonna lead us to delivering a, uh, a new technology that um, the rest of the world hasn't seen. We plan to demonstrate Guardian technology uh, at the 2020 Olympics. Uh, we're very excited about doing that, and we expect that a car will be put on sale with that technology shortly thereafter. We're also working on level four systems, what we call the chauffeur mode of autonomy, where the car truly can be given all the responsibility for driving on its own. We're trying to define the artificial intelligence DNA for Toyota vehicles, that there are these algorithms that are based on data and machine learning and advanced robotic capabilities, and they can be applied both towards the chauffeur mode where the car is doing the primary driving task and the guardian mode where it's the human driver that we're augmenting and making safer. Level five is really exciting. That is where the car can essentially drive itself during um, any kind of weather, during any kind of traffic, the same kind of environment that we can drive in. That is many years off. One of the big questions that we've been asking is how safe is safe enough? When is this technology ready to be deployed at large scale? 
It's one thing to make a five-minute YouTube video. It's another thing to think about deploying this technology at the scale of 10 million cars per year uh, and into the hands of just everyday people. And that is a huge challenge, I think. In order to do enough testing, we need billions of miles of testing. And that's more than you can practically do physically with cars. So when we hear about one manufacturer or the other testing millions of miles, uh, we think that's nice, but it's only a fraction of what needs to be done. We're using simulation in order to greatly expand the actual number of miles that are tested. And it's not simple simulation. It's simulation that takes the physical testing that we do and amplifies it to many more miles. Reliable, robust perception means that the car has a good understanding of the motion of vehicles, pedestrians, bicycles around it. Perception and prediction are some of the really core AI challenges. We've had some breakthroughs. Uh, one of the areas that we're working on is uh, cars that can see much further into the distance and have uh, a greater understanding of the situation that is ahead and around them. Uh, than current autonomous cars. We are very excited about building this sensor-rich new platform that will give us a huge leap in terms of capability to perceive objects in the environment reliably. TRI thinks that Toyota has a great opportunity to become number one in autonomous vehicles. And the reason for that is that autonomous driving in the future is not primarily gonna be about human-written software. It's gonna be about data. It's been said that uh, data is the new oil, or data is the new gold. We think Toyota has the potential to leverage its strengths in terms of its volume. Toyota can translate that volume of production advantage into a volume of data advantage through Toyota Connected to make our cars perform better in their AI than anybody else's. A robot is a much simpler version of a car. Toyota's expertise in managing that kind of a supply chain is going to be directly applicable to designing, manufacturing, deploying, servicing robots. We have organized our robotics research into three primary topics. The home, the factory, and enabling technologies. TRI's research is poised to make breakthroughs in manipulation. So you will see our robots picking things up and using tools, helping a person put heavy things away, taking things out of a grocery bag and putting them in the refrigerator. One of our best ideas for using robots around the home is telepresence, allowing the older adult to be in an environment that their body is not able to go to. We're also exploring the 2020 Olympics. Not everybody can go, but using the TRI robots, you might be able to log in to the robot, see through the robot eyes, listen through the robot ears, and feel like you are there. Not just watching it on television, but to really be up close and personal as if you were there. I've seen many studies of the market opportunities in robotics, and they're all shaped like this. The user experience is one of the most important parts of this work. Artificially intelligent systems could be scary, could be threatening. Designing for emotional attachment cuts across all of our efforts. User experience is all about creating a delightful and safe user experience around a product, melding the technology and the human, creating that perfect interaction between the two. In 2020, when we show the vehicles at the Olympics, we'll be showcasing how the car is taking in things like emotion data, or body posture, or eye gaze, all of these things working together to generate better user experience. We're making sure that we have a unified design language that extends all across the different screens within a vehicle. I want my grandma to be able to get in the car and immediately understand. And this, of course, builds trust with the interface. Material science has been central to the development of batteries and fuel cells. It was almost 20 years between the discovery of the lithium ion chemistry for batteries and its commercialization. 20 years is too long. TRI's goal is to accelerate the design and discovery of new materials by using artificial intelligence techniques. 
Toyota AI Ventures is a corporate venture capital fund. We'll be doing early stage startup investments in areas where TRI has core competency, artificial intelligence, robotics, self-driving vehicles, data and cloud. We're looking for startup entrepreneurs that have the vision, the grit, and integrity to help us answer the questions that we don't know the answers to. Toyota AI Ventures has made three investments so far that are public, really aimed at technology that can help support our research efforts in autonomous cars and advanced safety, as well as our robotics. Akio has been the most important person in the creation of TRI. It's incredible that a car company that has been as successful and as established as Toyota is willing to actually do this remarkably revolutionary thing of starting a new lab with a significant budget to look into the future. To me, it's a privilege to be helping to realize Akio Toyota's vision, how Toyota can transform itself. And to be part of this kind of very revolutionary transformative change in how we think about mobility. And I think there's an urgency to do this as quickly as we can. And I think we're on a strategy to get that technology into the market uh, as quickly as possible. The mission of the Toyota Research Institute is to use artificial intelligence to improve Toyota's ability to make ever better cars. AI is expanding and ever improving. And there will be more and more applications that will be directly relevant to Toyota. TRI's job is to find them and show they're possible. So clearly, our concept of mobility is changing. Mobility doesn't have to be limited to just cars. It can be mobility services, a new way to move you across town or even across the room. By 2030, the number of people over 65 will be almost twice what it is now. Mobility for elders, for the infirm, is something we want to make possible through different kind of devices, robots, and services. Personally, I like to think of Toyota as not just a car company, but a human movement company. And it's why we became the automotive sponsor of the 2020 Olympics, as well as the Paralympics and Special Olympics. Amy Parade is another person who inspires us and increases the determination to make mobility a reality for all to make us fun and enjoyable for everyone. Amy Parody is now a team Toyota athlete who served as spokesperson for both Olympic and personal mobility efforts. Let's meet her. I started snowboarding when I was 15 years old. There's such a freedom to it, and I knew that I would do it for the rest of my life. But suddenly, my life took a detour. It ended up being something called meningococcal meningitis. My life changed like that. When I lost my legs, I didn't think, how am I going to walk again? I just thought, how am I going to snowboard again? And it forced me to get creative. I called everywhere across the country to see if there were any prosthetic feet out there that were made for snowboarding, and I didn't find anything. I basically decided to make a pair of feet myself, and these feet led me to being able to follow one of the biggest passions of my life. When I first started working with Toyota, I was trying to redefine my own mobility and how I was going to do the things that I want to do. And it's just kind of serendipitous that now Toyota is so much more than just an automobile company. They're also redefining mobility and how they can help other people go to the places they want to go. About a year and a half ago, Mr. Toyota put out a challenge. We are going to become a company that is going to provide ever better mobility for all. Our company believes every person should have the ability to move without restriction. So our engineers are already thinking about things like a device for blind people called Blade. It helps by having a speaking device guide them around. What if a robot could help a paraplegic person be more mobile? Or I walk. 
It actually straps to your leg, making the movement for your legs. Another one is iBot. You're in a wheelchair, but what if that wheelchair could allow you to stand up? It's important not to just get caught up in the actual devices, but how is that learning and research paying off for our future? Toyota chose the sponsorship of the Olympics and Paralympics because it's the launching point for our company to actually leave just the automotive space and enter the mobility space and showcase many of the devices that we're currently working on. Toyota is so innovative, and I think that's what connects us so much. Toyota was supporting me when nobody was watching, before I was even in the Paralympic Games. And so now, to be able to represent a company that really wants to just eliminate the obstacles and help people be the best that they can be, that means a lot to me. We're always thinking about each individual and how to make their lives better. And I'm proud of that. I'm really proud of that. The creation of our products, the investment in autonomous driving, in artificial intelligence, TRI. But it's become clear over this last year and a half what we're going to do to make lives better. Provide you with mobility in ways you never thought possible. I hope all of you will come to Tokyo in 2020, not just to experience the Olympics, but to see all of the new technologies that we'll be showcasing, like our sponsorship of the Olympics, our relationship with our retailers around the world is a little hard to define in terms of ROI. But I believe, and I know I may be biased, that no OEM has a finer, more dedicated dealer organization than we do. There's a window to the market and a connection to the customers. And we benefit from that relationship every day. I know there is a debate about the franchise model, but we believe a partnership with our dealer is one of the keys to our success. So as long as we have product to sell and service, our dealers will be there to make sure our customers are happy and connected to our brand. I try to meet with our dealers around the world as often as possible because they really do energize me. Their input, along with inspiration from everything I experienced and everyone I meet, is what allows me to become the final filter at Toyota. The buck stops with me, as they say, and it's this hands-on approach to our product, our strategy, and our future that will hopefully keep us nimble, keep us fighting, and keep us ahead of the curve. I often tell our engineers when we are test driving a new car together that a good car should go where you aim it. Because if that, it means the driver can look farther down the road, which makes the drive not just safer, but more fun. That's how we try to tune each of our cars. And that's how I try to run our company, by trying to look farther down the road, by planning and investing in anticipation of what's around the next corner and what the future will bring. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for listening today. I will admit you that I was more than a little nervous to speak in front of such an impressive audience. But in conclusion, let me leave you with a few things I believe. I believe growth must be sustainable. I believe if you do the right thing, the money will follow. I believe we have to earn our customers' smiles every day and exceed their expectations. I believe there's no best, only better. I believe Toyota has proven and will continue to prove that we are a company of dedicated 
passionate people that can accomplish anything. And finally, I believe that we must always strive to help improve the lives of our customers and society as a whole. It is an honor and privilege to work for this company and to work for you. Our investors, it is an honor I do not take lightly. I hope that when this event is over, you will live with a deeper understanding of who we are and what we hope to accomplish. Because with their support, everything is possible. Thank you very much.